Well, morning everyone. Sunday's at nine. It is Christchurch Waterfall is who we are and you are very, very welcome this morning. My name is Dorian. I'm the pastor here. We've been meeting like this for 19 weeks now and it is not the norm for us because meeting together face to face is what we love to do and it's what God calls us to do. But in these unusual, very unusual days of pandemic, we are actually showing love for you, our neighbor, by almost sacrificing what we love to do. We're so glad that you've joined us online, especially if you've been invited as a friend to our special series, which ends today. Great that you have tuned in and really hope that you're going to do that again. We're going to begin by praying together, and it's a prayer where we recognize our sin and when we ask for God's forgiveness. It'll come up on your screen so you can pray it along with me as I pray. But before we do, let me read to you a prayer that King David prayed where he recognized his sin and his need for forgiveness. It comes from the Psalms. If you, O Lord, kept a record of sins, O Lord, who could stand? But with you there is forgiveness. Therefore you are feared. I wait for the Lord. My soul waits, and in his word I put my hope. O Israel, O Christchurch waterfall, put your hope in the Lord. For with the Lord is unfailing love, and with him is full redemption. And so with those words in mind, let's pray this prayer of confession together. Won't you join me? O Lord our God, you know us better than we know ourselves. Search us, O God, and know our hearts. Test our troubled thoughts. Forgive us all our wrongs. Transform us by your Spirit to live for you each day and to honor you with our lips and with our lives. Friends, our Heavenly Father has promised to forgive everyone who truly repents and trusts in Jesus Christ, his Son, our Savior. And his word tells us that we have been reconciled with God himself by Christ's death on the cross. And that through faith in Jesus, we can approach God with freedom and with confidence. And we're going to do that now as Rusty continues in prayer on our behalf. Let's pray together again. Good morning. Let's bow our heads in prayer. Psalm 150. Praise the Lord. Praise the Lord in his sanctuary. Praise him in his mighty heavens. Praise him for his acts of power. Praise him for his surpassing greatness. Praise him with the sounding of, your trump, of the trumpet. Praise him with the harp and lyre. Praise him with the sound tambourine and dancing. Praise him with strings and flute. Praise him with the clash of cymbals. Praise him with resounding cymbals. Let everything that has breath praise the Lord. Praise the Lord. Our almighty, everlasting, omnipresent Father God, we come before you with our hearts overflowing with love, praise, and thanksgiving. When we see the works of your hands, we know we serve an awesome and powerful God. Thank you, Father, that by your grace you sent our Lord Jesus to die as a reconciling sacrifice for our sins who was resurrected and ascended into heaven to act as our mediator at your right hand. Thank you for the gift of your Holy Spirit living in us, guiding us, comforting us, and sanctifying us. Thank you for your abounding love, grace, and mercy. Thank you for blessing us so richly daily with waking each morning, with breathing, rising from our warm beds, for the food on the table and the clothes on our backs. Lord, let us always count our blessing and not our want list. Thank you that we are able to meet together through the internet to hear your word during the epidemic. Thank you for the continued faithfulness of Dorian as he teaches us with wisdom and discernment. Thank you, Father, for the council growth group leaders, Pat and Pauline, that keep the wheels running smoothly and ensuring we get to hear your voice. Thank you, Father God, that we, we can learn praise and worship you freely, unlike many of our missionaries and our brothers and sisters in Christ that are being persecuted. We pray that you will comfort and protect them and remove the fear from their hearts. Fill them with 
fill them with the courage of their convictions and keeping them strong in their faith. We pray for all those that are lost, especially your loved ones. Please soften their hearts to hear your quiet, still voice and heed your call. Please let us lead lives that will encourage the lost to have what we have and the promise of eternal life with you. Lord, we bring those in need before you, those ill with COVID virus, those who have lost loved ones, those battling with depression, retrenchment, homelessness, and financial strain. Lord, we pray you will heal and restore the sick and broken and bring comfort and hope to the lonely and grieving. Bring light to those in despair and courage to those suffering. We pray that they will find a peace that will find the peace of God that transcends all understanding. Lord, we pray for your protection over doctors, nurses, cleaners, and all those involved with keeping us healthy during this pandemic. We pray that a vaccine is found soon. We pray that our country and all our leaders, we pray for all those involved with corruption. We pray for our country and all our leaders. We pray for all those involved with corruption and will be held accountable. Lord, we know that you are in control and we are unable to see your plan. So we ask that you keep us strong in our faith and patient while your will is being done. And we end with Jude's doxology. To him who is able to keep you from stumbling, to present you faultless, to present you before his glorious presence without fault and great joy. To our only God, our Saviour, be glory, majesty, power, and authority through Jesus Christ our Lord before all ages, now and forevermore. Amen. Friends, just some, some reminders and things to kind of take note of. Firstly, to those of you who are members of Christchurch Waterfall and those who perhaps consider yourselves partners with us, I want to talk to you about our virtual annual vestry meeting. You'll have received just over the last few days the ministry and finance report for the past year. Thanks to those of you who've already read them and completed the little survey form that I sent out. It really just helps to make things almost official. To anyone who's listening who'd, who'd like to join in the prayer and thanksgiving meeting that's going to take place over Zoom on Tuesday this coming week, Tuesday evening, please won't you contact the church office. The number is going to come up on your screen and uh, they'll be able to give you details of that meeting. Secondly, um, today is the last chance to sign up for this quarter's Christianity Explored course. We've heard about it a lot over the last few weeks and it's for you, especially if you are new to Christian things or perhaps you've, you've been away from Christian things for a while and you want to think about them again. You can sign up and you can get more details of the course on our website, but go there after the service and sign up for this course. You won't regret it. And, uh, and lastly, next week's Sundays at 9 will be a communion service online in our homes. And so just like last time, uh, won't you prepare for that this week? Get some bread and get some grape juice ready. I'm, I'm really, really looking forward to sharing that special sacrament with you next week at 9. I'm going to hand over to, to Cindy Crow now, who is going to introduce what is coming up next in our service. Over to you, Cindy. Good morning, CCW and anybody watching. This morning we're going to be focusing a little bit on our kids and families. So Pauline's going to be up next and give us a little bit of a kids slot so that you can get an idea of what your kids can expect when they join us on Sundays. And after her we've got a couple of our teenagers from Rooted giving some info on that. And then we're going to have a quick look at what happens in Kids Club. Enjoy! Hello boys and girls, mums and dads, grannies and grandpas, everybody this week. Welcome to Children's Church at Home. So, grab your juice and grab a biscuit and come and join us. This week, we're going to look at the Psalms. And in particular, Psalm 18, verse 2, 
which describes God as our fortress. But first, I want to tell you a little bit about the book of Psalms. It's a book in the Bible, in the middle of the Bible. And it's made up of 150 different poems and songs, mostly written by King David. One of the things I love about the Psalms is that there is a whole range of emotions found in them. So one Psalm might be really happy and joyful, yay! And then another Psalm might be sad. <laughs> and the writer is very obviously upset. In another Psalm, they might be thankful and praising God. And in another psalm, they might be really angry and asking God some serious questions. But it doesn't matter how the psalmist, that's the person writing the psalm, is feeling. Because they can always go to God. The psalms, they talk about different words to describe God. He is our strength. He is our rock. And he is our help. And one in particular, Psalm 18, verse 2. And it says, The Lord is my rock and my fortress, my deliverer. Now, I like the word fortress because it's a safe place to go, like a big castle. But unfortunately, we're stuck at home right now. And we can't go to a castle or a fortress. So I guess that means we'll have to make our own. Let's go. not sure how sturdy it is. I think if someone was to lean on it just too hard, it would fall down. But it's a good thing that God is a real fortress and a rock, someone we can really rely on. We're all facing really challenging times. We want to change our lives so much and sometimes from day to day. Some of us were back at school, and then we weren't. Some of us haven't even gone back to school yet. Some of us might be having a great time at home. We're loving not going to school. But some of us might be missing our friends and not enjoying this time so much. But the Psalms teach us that no matter how we are feeling, we can always go to God even if we are feeling a little wobbly. God is our fortress. He is strong and secure and a safe place. So no matter how we are feeling, we can go to him. Now this week, I have a challenge for all of you. And it's a big one. The challenge is for everyone, not just for the kids. Are you listening, adults? It's for everyone. I want to challenge you to build your own fort. So go grab some sheets, some blankets, some clothes pegs, whatever you can find, and use the furniture to make your own fort. Get mom and dad and granny and grandpa to help you. Don't worry if it doesn't look very good in the end. Just remember, it's the fourth that counts. Ha ha ha. 
Once you're done, take a photo of your fort and send it for us to see. And just in closing, one final thought. Remember, no matter what we are feeling, we can go to God because he is our safe place, our fortress. We can go to God by regularly praying. Or you could write a poem or a song like they did in the Psalms. Why don't you take some time this week and do that? Do it inside your fort to remind you that God is our fortress. Um, what has Rooted been during lockdown for me? Um, I've enjoyed Rooted. Uh, as much as it's not really human contact, I have enjoyed it. Um, it's been a place of encouragement and just a place to learn about God even through like such a tough time of like struggling with being alone. Um, just being around friends and being able to talk to friends even if it's through the phone is better than nothing. Um, so I think for me it's it's been it's been nice to know that I can actually talk to people on the other side of the phone. Hey guys, so I've been doing Rooted for quite a while now and I think it's helped me understand the Bible a lot more than I used to and it put me out of my comfort, comfort zone um, quite a lot and I think it's helped me a lot, helped me get better with people in general. Um, you know on Fridays we uh, play games and I always win because no one else seems to be as good as me. And on Sundays, we focus more on the Bible and we try to understand it more. And I think it's really helped me as a person to be, to be a better person. I really, I really think more people should join. So I encourage more people to join because uh, I was really weary about it at first. But uh, yeah, I don't have any regrets uh, joining it now. Yeah. Friends, we, we come now to the Bible. When we're hearing from the Bible, we believe together with Christians down through the ages, in fact, that we are actually hearing God speaking to us. So the creator and the sustainer of the universe is speaking directly to you this morning. It is such a privilege. So we, we really want to listen out. 
Won't you open your Bibles then? Linda is going to introduce and read the passage for us, and then we're going to delve into our topic for this morning, which is do not judge to see whether it's fake or fact. Thanks, Linda. Our reading today is taken from Matthew 7, verses 1 to 6. Now hear the word of the Lord. Do not judge, or you too will be judged. For in the same way you judge others, you will be judged, and the measure you use, it will be measured to you. Why do you look at the speck of, your, of sawdust in your brother's eye, and pay no attention to the plank in your own eye? How can you say to your brother, Let me take the speck out of your eye, when all the time there is a plank in your own eye? You hypocrite! First take the plank out of your own eye, and then you will see clearly to remove the speck from your brother's eye. Do not give dogs what is sacred. Do not throw your pearls to pigs. If you do, they may trample them under their feet, and then turn and tear you to pieces. This was the word of the Lord. I want to start by speaking to you about words. I don't know whether you think much about words, but they're quite a remarkable thing that we can speak to each other and use things like words. But words are funny things and they have kind of ranges of meanings. And context helps you work out what the particular meaning is when it's being used. And, uh, and they change meanings over time and in different cultures. So words can be quite tricky. If I say to you the word wicked and ask you what it means, I'll now put it in a sentence, and the sentence goes like this, that was wicked. What does it mean in that sentence? It was awesome, or that was evil. How do you work out which is which? That was awesome, or that was evil? Well, it depends on the age of the person speaking. Isn't that right? So, so if it's someone like me, you know that it means awesome. If it's someone much older, you know that they're just talking about evil and so on. You know that if I say the words just now in England, uh, I'll get to it just now. They're expecting you to do it straight away. Whereas just now for you can be an indeterminate amount of time. Now, why am I starting here? Because we're going to be looking at a verse today that is perhaps the most misunderstood verse in the Bible. And it's misunderstood for exactly this reason, that words have a range of meanings. And I want to take you through today what this verse doesn't mean, what it does mean, and why it means that. Why, why it's important that it means that. But I, I want to say up front that this is an important task. I don't, I don't know if you're watching for the first time uh, or you, you're not a regular church goer and you kind of think, well, what, what's, why, why, is this worth, why is it worth listening to this? Well, well, let me explain why it is worth doing this exercise together. It might sound a little dry and academic to try and work out what a word means and so on. But it is hugely important uh, because looking closely at this verse will help us to hear what God is actually saying and that's got to be a worthy exercise isn't it it'll help us understand what he is saying and what he's not saying so that we get his word right by doing it will also help us think about our lives and our culture I want us to be a little bit self-reflective today because one of the reasons this verse is so misunderstood is because of something that's going on for us. And to begin to, to actually explore what's going on for us will help us see ourselves better and know better how to move forward. And it'll help us, of course, obey God. Knowing what he's actually saying helps us to obey it. Come with me to Matthew 7. That's where this most misunderstood verse in the Bible is. And it's there in verse 1. Do not judge, or you too will be judged. Do not judge, or you too will be judged. 
Now, my plan is to take us through what it's not meaning, then what it is saying, and then why it matters that it's saying what it's saying, and then hopefully apply it towards the end. And so let me tell you what it's not saying. It's not saying don't ever make judgments. It's not saying that. I know that it says don't judge, but it's not actually saying don't ever judge. Now you're sitting there going, what's, what's he on about? So, so I'll try and explain it in a moment. But the most popular way of reading, uh, reading this verse is to believe that it's saying don't ever make judgments. And so, you know, if you're not familiar, if, if you've got any familiarity, should I say, with, with Facebook or social media or that kind of thing, it's regularly the case that if, if there's a discussion with Christians debating people in the community or whatever it is, it's almost invariably the case that someone will pull out Matthew 7 verse 1, lob it into the comments thread and say, you Christians should stop judging people. Jesus actually says, do not judge. You should stop making these judgments. Now, that's typically the most popular way that it's used. Let me give you a few reasons why I can't mean that, that we're not ever to make judgments. Firstly, just some, some human logic reasons, and then the really big reasons that the Bible gives to us. But let me give you the, the human logic reasons first. Firstly, it's, it's not actually possible to live like that. It's not possible to live as someone who never makes judgments. To function in life, you've got to make judgments. You have to make judgments about people. You have to make judgments about your parents, how they raised you, whether that was a good way to be raised, whether you, you want to do it their way or another way. You have to make judgments about friends and where they're living and how they're behaving. You have to make judgments about politicians, whether, whether you're going to vote for them or not. You have to make judgments about good and bad, right, wrong, true, false. You have to make judgments. That's what life is caught up with. And it's hypocritical to think that you can get through life without making judgments. In fact, it's hypocritical to use Matthew 7 verse 1 of someone else who's making judgments. Do you know why it's hypocritical? Because when you say to them, you ought not make judgments, what have you just done? You've judged them. You've judged them to be wrong about making judgments. And told them not to do it. The, the very thing that, that you've just done to them. And that's called hypocrisy. We need to make judgments. The only way you could live, assuming that this verse means never to make judgments, is to pretend that you're not making them. But you are, all the time. Do you remember that family in the shops where the, the mother was yelling at her kids and, and what you were doing as you walked out of the shops, I know what you were doing. You were making a judgment about how dreadful it was to treat kids like that. Or you were walking out of the shops going, oh, I hope no one saw me screaming at my kids. Because one or the other was you as you went through that experience, wasn't it? And so you just can't not do it. You have to do it. And it's not a criticism. You, you can't live life without it. There's, there's, so there's some reasons why it can't mean don't ever make judgments. There's an additional one, actually. There's a sense in which God has made us to be judging creatures. He's, he's made us with a conscience, rational, to discern and make judgments. We have, have, have judges on the bench in courts who make a judgment. and We, we need them to do that. But let me give you the strongest reasons where, the, where it can't mean don't ever make judgments. And they come from the Bible, which is, of course, the, the place that you must go to work out what you should think about these things. Take a look at verse 3, won't you? There's, there's a particular teaching there about specks and planks and so on that requires you to make judgments. So, so let me take you through this, verse 3. <clears throat> Why do you look at the speck of sawdust in your brother's eye and pay no attention to the plank in your own eye? So the speck of sawdust, a problem, a problem you discern or judge to be there in their character. Why do you look at the problem in your brother's eye, uh, 
that 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 you've you've discerned that you've discerned to be there, and pay no attention to the massive problem in your own eye. Verse four: How can you say to your brother, "Let me take the speck out of your eye," when all the time there's a plank in your own eye? You hypocrite! First take the plank out of your own eye, and then you'll see clearly to remove the speck from your brother's eye. Now there's a lot there. We'll come, we'll come back to it in a moment. But I just want to draw your attention to the fact that Jesus, in verse 5, wants you to remove the problem from your brother's eye. He wants you to, to be noticing that there is a problem, judging that there's a problem, and to engage in helping in that problem. So whatever he means by do not judge, he can't mean don't ever make judgments, because he's told us that we are, to, we are to make judgments. And it's a very grave misunderstanding to, to think that's what he means. But what does he mean? Well, let, let me take you secondly through what it does mean. And to put it very briefly, I'm going to tell you what I think that it means, and then explain that. I think what Jesus means by do not judge is... Do not be judgmental. You know, words like our word wicked have a range of meanings, and the word judge is no different. The word judge can mean to discern, to assess, to make a judgment in a very neutral case like the judge does in a court case. It can also mean to be condemnatory and judgmental. What is it to be judgmental? It's to be the fault finder. It's to be someone who's nitpicking, someone who no matter what you say will find a reason and a way to show that it's wrong. It'll be someone who reads motives into everything you do and gives you the worst possible motive to back their judgment, even to make their judgment even harsher. It's someone who is negative and destructive, someone who needs to judge, who can't leave it alone, who has to step in and tell everyone and tell you. It's someone who sets themselves up not only to, to not only judge, but to condemn and dismiss, and who does it from a place of arrogant superiority. That's what it is to be judgmental. And Jesus says, you must not. Why now are we not to be judgmental? Why does it matter so much that we do not judge in terms of being judgmental? Well, I've got three reasons why I think Jesus says not to be judgmental. And two of them come from our passage. So let me take you to the first one. It's there in verse 2. Well, verse 1, do not judge or you too will be judged. Verse 2, 4. So the word for explains verse 1. For in the same way as you judge others, you will be judged. And with the measure you use, it will be measured to you. So what's Jesus saying? If you go down the path of being a nitpicker, fault finder, legalistic judge of others and things, if you go down that path, you'll invite the same attitude back and you won't survive because you are not perfect. Now, now this is obvious in most relationships, isn't it? You, you may have seen them like I have. If you become the person in a close relationships where you become the nitpicker, picking up on everyone's faults, assuming the worst motives, if you become that person in a marriage relationship, in a friendship, then people will come back at you in the same way and it will spiral into destruction. With the measure you use, it will be used against you. But on the other hand, if you're generous and, uh, and generous, particularly in spirit to other people, you'll invite generosity back. 1 Peter 4 verse 8 is that beautiful verse. Above all, love each other deeply because love covers over a multitude of sins. Love is able to uh, turn a blind eye, let people go, give them space, be generous towards them, to find the best in them. And, and I've seen, I'm sure that you have as well, some relationships where everyone is quick to mock the other person, pick up on their faults, and the family just has this, this cultivated sense of hostility towards each other. 
But I've seen other relationships over many years now where there's generosity, where they can almost only see the good of each other, where they cover over, where there's warmth and grace, and it invites a culture of warmth towards each other. And there's, a, there's kind of a, a growing intimacy. You know, that principle works in human relationships, but it particularly applies to God. And here's, I take it, why Jesus teaches us this. You see, the Sermon on the Mount, which is what chapter 7 is part of, is not just a series of life lessons. In fact, I think that the big overarching theme of the Sermon on the Mount is the kingdom of heaven. The kingdom of heaven. I think Jesus comes into this world and he comes from his father. He is born as a man and he, and he comes to bring us back to God because the kingly rule of God is coming back to his world. And he comes sent by his father to reconcile us back to God through the forgiveness that he establishes on the cross. So that sinners such as you and me can be brought back under the kingship of God in the kingdom of heaven when it is established. And so the Sermon on the Mount is kind of like Jesus saying, let, let me tell you who's already in the kingdom. Let me tell you how to be a member of the kingdom. Because the kingdom's coming, God's judgment is coming, and you need to be right with the king. And, and here's what it looks like to be in the kingdom. Jesus is teaching on the kind of precipice of eternity. He's teaching with this very great sense that at any moment the kingdom will come in. And if you are not found in Christ, you are in deep, deep trouble because the rule of God will come and wipe out all opposition. And so chapter 7 verse 1, do not judge or you too will be judged, is an invitation to the Jewish people particularly and to us who kind of read from a distance, it's an invitation to not be hypocritical. Why do you judge, judge as, as if others have got no hope and you're okay? You hypocrites. Everything you judge them to be doing, you're doing as well. You've got no hope except for the grace of God. Do not be judgmental. Don't be fault-finding, picking, making the worst of people, because if you live like that, you invite the judgment of God on the same criterion category, and you won't survive that judgment, because the measure you use will be measured to you. I think that's what Jesus is saying. Now, this, this is actually an eternally serious issue. This is massively important. Friends, if your only hope before the God of the universe is that he covers over your sin, is that he treats you graciously, because that's my only hope. If that's our only hope, then make sure that's the measure you use towards others. Grace and generosity, covering over a multitude of sin, not being a fault finder, the negative, destructive, nitpicker, the legalist. Learn to be gracious and generous because you've received that generosity from God himself. So there's why it matters. Because the measure you use will be the measure you receive. And we've received so much grace from God. Let's exhibit grace to others. Don't be judgmental and condemnatory. So there's the first big reason why it matters to not be judgmental. The second reason that we're not to be judgmental is because we are very bad at making judgments. And that is the point of verses 3, 4, and 5. He talks there, you remember, about the speck and the plank. Verse 5, take the plank out of your own eye, and then you will see clearly to remove the speck from your brother's eye. And the point he's making is this. When I'm inclined to judge another person, I don't do it with clear eyes. When I'm inclined to judge another person, I do it with massive problems of my own that kind of cloud and color my ability to actually see the speck. Now, he's not saying, therefore, don't ever judge. You remember, we had that conversation. 
But the point I want to raise for you is be aware of your limitations. When you do criticize someone else, so often, very often it's shaped by, by your own baggage. And here's the problem. You don't see it of yourself, typically. Everyone else is seeing it, though. What are you bringing to the criticism? Why are you so critical of people who fail and don't do what they ought to do and let others down? Why are you so critical of all of that? It'll be because of something in you. It'll be because of massive planks in you, the way you were raised, the guilt that you might carry about that particular thing. And these things can trigger reactions. And that can be a dreadful place from which to actually help another person. So be aware of what you bring to these things, your critique, your criticism. It's so easy to get it wrong. And here's something else to think about. When I see something that someone else is doing and I become angry, look in. Look in. What, what's going on for me? Why does that get under my skin so much? And don't pretend you've got no reactions. But think about what's, what's actually happening for you. You'll be in a much better place to actually help and serve others. So there's a second reason Jesus says don't be judgmental. Because we're not very good at making judgments. I'll give you the third reason though. Why does it matter that we not be judgmental? Because we're not God. Let me take you to a couple of other places that have this, this insight. Come with, me, come with me to Romans 14. Paul says in verse 1, Accept him whose faith is weak without passing judgment on disputable matters. And then a few verses later, Paul becomes more explicit. Verse 4, who are you to judge someone else's servant? To his own master he stands or falls, and he will stand, for the Lord is able to make him stand. You see what Paul is saying here? He's saying, don't judge others because they're someone else's servant. They will stand before God who will judge them. Don't, don't put yourself in the place of God to be their judge. They're someone else's servant, not yours. So don't judge. God is the one who does that. But I want you to notice this. This, this language about not judging, verse 1, it's, it's concerning disputable matters. It's in the context of issues that are trivial. You know, what we eat and whether some don't eat meat and some only eat vegetables, whether, whether someone has Friday as their holy day or Saturday as their holy day. Paul's saying, don't judge each other over disputable matters. So do you see the, the same pattern going on here? He's not saying don't ever make judgments about anything. He's saying don't judge over disputable matters. Now I'm going to apply it in just a moment. But let me just pause and encourage you to notice something of what I've been trying to do. What I've been trying to do in all of this is work hard to be careful. I've been wanting to show you that you, you need to be careful with the Bible. You need to work hard to understand the full teachings of the scriptures to, to make sure that you don't just grab one verse and make it say what you want it to say. We need to take great care that as followers of Christ, we need to be most concerned about growing up in our mature thinking, to think things through biblically. And we've done a, a lot on this this morning, particularly because we live at a time and a place and a culture that is determined to eradicate any judgments from our culture. So... All of us who have, have kind of grown up in the last 50 years, we've been part of a movement that sought to bring peace by getting rid of ever making judgments. Uh, we, we've seen over the years the, the terrible wars and fights and arguments, and we've come to the conclusion that the answer to, to, what, uh, to, to all of that is to stop believing that anyone's right or wrong. 
and believe that everyone's right. It's called relativism. Everyone's truth is true for them. It creates a kind of peace and harmony where, where no one can throw stones at each other because everyone's right, really, if you could just see it through their eyes. We hate the kind of fighting that's happened, and so we've seized a solution. But the solution that we've seized in the end is death itself. The fact is, there is a truth outside of us. And Jesus says it is the only way to be set free, to know that truth. If there is such a thing as truth, there is necessarily such a thing as error. And that we know what is true and that we know what is false becomes a matter of life and death, friends. And a culture that says it doesn't matter what you believe as long as you're sincere is actually one that is kind of wallpapering over a massive crack in the foundations of our existence. And we've raised generations of young men and women imagining that it doesn't matter. And we have consigned them to death because it does matter. Being true to yourself is not the way to find life. It's the way to be enslaved to your own passions. Knowing yourself is desperately important, but knowing yourself in all the mess and evil that's part of who you are so that you can discern what to get rid of and what to embrace and what to, what to leave under the great truth of the gospel of God. The bottom line here is life is complex. Our culture has not given us the right answers. Do not judge. Do not make any judgments. It is naive, destructive, and foolish. It is not what Jesus is teaching. Let me try and apply this to us just a little bit more. How do you work out when you're just making right judgments? And how do you work out when you're becoming judgmental? How do you work that out? It's often tricky. But sometimes it's not so tricky. Let me tell you when it's not so tricky. That's, that's the easiest one. If you find yourself always turning, to, uh, turning into the person who's finding fault with others, if, if that's your first instinct, you need to have a strong dose of reading Matthew 7 and learn to get out of that habit and out of that pattern. Work out what's going on for you in that you can only find fault. Your, your comments are always critical. You're always seeing the problems. Why is that you? Find out what's going on for you. If you find it hard to praise people and rejoice in the good. Because you're in, in a problem place, let me tell you. I'd encourage those of you who find it hard, not, hard to not judge. I, I'd encourage you to, to learn to let these things go. Actively kind of hand them over to God to actively in prayer say, this is your servant, Lord. I'll entrust them to you, knowing that I've got so many of my own problems. Look, I work hard at doing this regularly, learning, learning to trust that God, by his spirit, will work in people's lives and grow them in his time. But on the other hand, if you squirm at anything that suggests that someone else might be wrong, if you squirm at the teaching of the Bible that talks about the judgment of God, I think that there might, might be something going on for you that's actually caught up in a culture. And you're very much shaped by the culture and not sufficiently by what the Bible teaches. Friends, the big issue here is that we only stand because we have received the generous grace of God who has covered over our sins, who has not counted our sins against us. We are called to be that towards others. Let's pray together. Heavenly Father, we thank you for your grace and kindness to us and ask please that you might help us grow in love and generosity and grace towards others. And we ask it in Jesus' name. Amen.